Hello and welcome to this talk. My name is Verena Neda. I'm from AMOLF, an institute in Amsterdam in the Netherlands, and I'm happy to talk to you today about spectrum splitting and directivity control by metagratings integrated in photovoltaic devices. Before I start my talk, I would like to say thank you to all the people that were involved in the project. First, I will start with my group, Flores Uleman, Andrea Cordaro, and my supervisor Albert Polman from AMOLF. Then thanks to Andrea Alou from the CUNY in New York. Also thanks to Dong and Shirt from Soliance and from Stefan from ECN TNO. I'm going to start my talk explaining to you what I mean by meta gratings and how we can control the spectrum and the directivity by using those. For the spectrum control in the meta grating, we use high index nanoparticles, for example, here placed on a substrate. Those high index nanoparticles scatter the incoming light on different resonance wavelengths. For example, here we show an FTD simulation of a silicon nanowire on a sapphire substrate with a width of 110 nanometer and a height of 175 nanometer. And you can see that there are several resonances in the optical regime. We look at the first one more closely and see here we plot the magnetic field that we have a magnetic dipole resonance in that case. As a second part, we want to control the direction. So for the direction, we use gratings. If we just look at any kind of grating, so different particles spaced with a specific pitch, we can control the diffraction angle for a specific wavelength following the grating equation. A grating can have, for example, the shape for 1D grating, like lines like here, or 2D gratings, a grid or a hexagonal grid. In this case, now we see an example where we have first diffraction orders in reflection and in transmission, as well as just the reflection back in the straight transmission. If we now combine the scatterer in the grating, so that means we put the nanoparticles in the grating condition, then we can control the direction for the resonance wavelengths that we chose before. So the light on resonance is interacting with the particles and is then diffracted in the diffraction angles. An extra property of the meta grating is that we can cancel the spectral reflection. We can do this by tuning the, the scatterer in such a way that scattering upwards from the scatterer and reflection from the um, substrate interferes destructively. Like this, we can have a grating that only scatters light into the diffraction orders on the resonance wavelength, but not back to the zero order. I'm going to show two applications to you where we use meta gratings in photovoltaics. The first application are resonant meta gratings for red colored rooftop photovoltaics. So here what we want to do is that we have a solar cell on a rooftop and we want it to be red for an observer on the street. One way to color the solar cell red is to put nanoparticles with a red resonance on top of it. But in that way we would just have scattering um, in a specular direction. What we want is really scattering only to the street and like this we can save light for the solar cell. The way we do this is using meta gratings and one meta grating serves a specific set of diffraction angles and cancels out the zero order and we combine several of those meta gratings into one array that we then have a super cell matter surface which reflects light on the resonance wavelength between 30 degrees to 74 degrees. We tune the whole structure for 650 nanometer light which is in the red wavelength regime. The building blocks that we have here are silicon nanowires on the sapphire substrate. Actually, that's the FTD simulation that I showed you in the very beginning. If we now look at the reflectance spectrum of such one of such meta grating, so here we have the dimensions and we have a pitch of 900 nanometer, we can see that first the total reflection is peaking in the red wavelength regime. So we have red reflection. The second thing that is important to notice is that we tuned the grating in such a way that almost all of the reflected light is reflected to the first refraction order, at least at resonance. At the zero order, everything is transmitted. The background here comes from the substrate of the sapphire. I can also show what I said before, that we have cancellation of the, um, of the reflection from the substrate and the scattering of a silicon nanowire. What you can see here is the electric field simulation. First reflection from the sapphire, second from scattering from the, from the nanowire on the substrate. And you can see that the field is um, out of phase and destructively interfering. 
We fabricated those structures in our NanoLab, and you can see an SEM image from the top of the structure. Here are the nanowires, and they are aligned next to each other in different meta gratings. So if you look carefully, the pitch, the period between the nanowires is decreasing in this direction. And here then the new supercell starts. If we make optical measurements, now angle resolved reflectance measurements, we can see the effect that we designed the structure for. So here you see the angle and the relative reflectance. You can see two things. So first, we still have a zero order reflection. Here the zero order reflection is around 6%. So we didn't cancel it completely, but it's only 6%, so it's pretty low. And then here we have exactly the diffraction pattern that we designed the structure for between 30 degrees and 70 degrees. One extra information is that we tried to achieve um, the scattering following a cosine law, so meaning a Lambertian scatterer, such that for the eye, the brightness is the same from all angles. And we actually achieved it to follow it, more or less. This is a measurement at 650 nanometer. Next, we also did EQE measurements of our sample. You can see the EQE measurement here. And first, we start with the blue line, which is just the EQE of the bare cell and gives a short circuit current of almost 39 milliampere per square centimeter. And then the, the orange curve is only the sapphire substrate. So here the EQE drops by around 10% because that's a reflection of the sapphire. Next, we, have, we add the meta grating and we can see two important things. First, of course, we have a drop in the EQE, EQE around the resonance wave things because that's where we reflect the red light. But also above, those resonance wavelengths, we have almost no losses in the EQE. We do have some losses here in the blue wave wavelength regime because silicon absorbs, the silicon nanowires absorb some light here. If you look at the total drop in the JSC, we only have a drop of 12.5%. And this includes actually mostly the reflection from the sapphire substrate. So if we use a different substrate and maybe an anti-reflection coating, we can reduce this number by a lot. We put a picture of our small cute meta grating here that is put on a solar cell. You can see that we have actually a nice red orange reflection. This photo was taken under 45 degrees. The next application I want to talk about is a spectral splitting light trapping layer for four terminal perovskite silicon tandem cells. The problem that we try to solve here is that if we have a solar spectrum that is absorbed by a perovskite silicon tandem cell, ideally what we want is that after the band gap of perovskite, in our case 800 nanometer, everything of the light is absorbed in the perovskite and everything above this band gap um, in silicon. But what happens in reality is that we always have this little tail here close to the band gap that is not absorbed in the perovskite, usually because the perovskite cannot be made thick enough, and then ends up in the silicon cell and is absorbed and transferred there. So we want to include a light trapping, a spectral splitting layer on the bottom side of the perovskite that reflects the light back to the perovskite such that it is absorbed there completely. We thought about two different designs for achieving this. The first would be just really a spectral splitter, basically a filter reflecting back all the light below the band gap back to the perovskite and transmitting the rest. The second design also includes light trapping, so meaning that we have an angle, angled reflection in such a way that the light that is reflected back to the perovskite um, experience light trapping and is then absorbed even better in the perovskite. We compared these two scenarios here in the graph where we show the shockley chrysler efficiency compared to the step, step size of the potential filter. So this filter um, function would be complete reflection up to a specific step and then complete transmission. This would be a perfect spectral splitter, in this case at 800 nanometer, and exactly this is the step that we change here. So let's first look at the only spectral splitter. The black line would be the shockley chrysler efficiency of our tandem cell without any spectral splitter. And with just a spectral splitter, we can add a little bit of efficiency here, but we can also see that we actually drop below the other shockley chrysler limit if we choose a spectral splitter with a, uh, close to the, to the band gap, like exactly at the band gap. The reason for this is that if light is just reflected back, we actually lose some of the light on the top swap part of the perovskite because it's transmitted once more, but it's then escaping and it's not um, not absorbed in the perovskite nor in the silicon. So ideally what we want is this dashed line, so it's back split up with plus light trapping, where the light is reflected back to the perovskite and then completely absorbed in the perovskite. With this scenario, we could ideally win 1.5% in the Sockley-Chrysler efficiency. 
I want to talk more in detail about what actually we can gain by having light trapping in the perovskite cell. We compare different scenarios here and look at how much light is not absorbed in the perovskite in that way. So if we have one pass through the perovskite, we see that there's a lot of light close to the band gap that we actually don't absorb. If we have something like a mirror, so basically two passes, light is reflected back once, we already increase how much light we can absorb. In the next step, we can add a grating. For example, here a 600 nanometer, 550 nanometer, and the light that is uh, reflected back is reflected at an angle and then trapped once in the in the perovskite and then reflected out. It is important that the periodicity is chosen in such a way that it is out of the total uh, internal reflection cone. Only then we can use this total internal reflection and light is trapped. We made several different designs. I'm showing here two to you. So in this case, we use hydrogenated amount of silicon cylinders on a glass substrate with those dimensions, and we put them in a hexagonal grid. You can see that the reflection here actually is exactly at the range where we need it, so between 600 and 800 nanometer. That would be the total reflection, and the diffraction almost is, uh, and this is almost completely diffraction. Only a part, slow part. A really small part is um, reflected specularly. Another very interesting point is that everything above 800 nanometer is actually not reflected. So we have something like a built-in anti-reflection layer here. The shock requires efficiency that we achieve with this could be increased by 0.3%. This doesn't sound too much, but we have to, to take into account that in this scenario, scenario, we only included what we could actually gain from that part, from the spectral splitter. We don't include what we could gain from this anti-reflection part that actually in the current cells is not as good. So there might be a higher improvement than we, than we think. We also try different structures, mainly because we want to be able to have this absorption even higher. We want to crank it up to, to 1%. So we try, for example, here three cylinders instead of one. And we get a different kind of scattering, a different kind of reflection. But the sarcocrisal efficiency at this point uh, is, is the same. From the first scenario, so from the scenario with the one cylinder in a unit cell, we compare the phase difference between the scattering of the cylinders and the reflection from the substrate, and we can see that the phase is close to, the phase delay is close to 1 pi. So this is, uh, explains the, the cancellation also in the infrared light. The amplitude of the, those, of the two cases is pretty close to equal. I also want to give you an impression how we plan to fabricate the sample. We're going to use skill imprint lithography. So for this, we start with the silicon on glass and spin coat a salt shell on top. We use a skill imprint, imprint stamp and print a pattern into the salt shell. And then we transfer the pattern into the silicon by reactive iron etching. We're going to flip around the sample and put it on the bottom side of the perovskite cell. In the case of the four terminal devices that we used, perovskite and silicon is connected with an air grab. So that's ideally for our light trapping structure. We already started fabrication of the master for the skill stem. And you can see here the nice round cylinders of our uh, scattering structure. To conclude, I hope I could show you today that we can use transparent metric ratings to control the spectrum and the direction of light by putting resonance scatterers into diffraction ratings. We can also cancel the spectral reflection by creating destructive interference between the scattering and the reflection. We use those transparent metric ratings in two different applications. First, we create a red rooftop solar cell with only directional reflection of red light. And second, we try to improve a four terminal perovskite silicon device by including a spectral splitting and light trapping layer to the perovskite cell. Thank you for your attention and I'm happy to take your questions.